tell us how important foreign investment is for Myanmar at the moment? Um, as you know, we started our reform process after the elections. And uh, one of the first things that we recognize that for, in order for us to develop, it's not, in, uh, it's not enough to rely on domestic savings because domestic savings is limited what we have. So the key driver of any economic growth in our country is foreign direct investment. Uh, this is experience that we find in China, in Vietnam, in our neighboring countries. And even in the United States, they're still talking about attracting foreign direct investment. So therefore, for us, the imperative is to attract as much as you can foreign direct investment. So the attracting uh, foreign direct investment becomes one of our major economic uh, reform processes. And in that context, we also have uh, constituted a new foreign investment law and also a new citizen investment law. So the two laws are in operation which then assures the foreign investors of uh, that uh, their interests will be protected, at the same time ensuring that the national interests are also adhered to. Some have advised caution to businesses before they invest in Myanmar. Uh, they say they should wait for the reform process till it's a little bit further along before they should start to invest. I mean, what do you say to them? Uh, I mean, being cautious is one thing. But I think uh, as the Asian last frontier, there are so many opportunities for foreign investors that, uh, you know, depending on which country you are from, uh, we now have, in the past, as you know, because of the sanctions that we had, uh, we had very little investment. I, I would say almost none from European countries, from the United States. But after the lifting of the sanctions, partial lifting, we now have a lot of uh, investment from European countries, a lot of investment also from the US countries. So the question is, it's no longer, you know, uh, whether you should invest or not. The question is, when do we invest? So as was said this morning, uh, we're trying to promote uh, the, uh, developed a conducive business environment so that people, foreign direct investment people are reassured that their interests will be protected. We're doing our best, but especially on the question of rule of law, because that to me is, is critical, because the foreign investment investors must recognize that we have uh, agreed or acceded to the New York Convention, which means that if there are any cases of arbitration or disputes, that the international law will kick in, uh, superseding the local laws. So we're doing our best with, with that, you know, bending backwards to reassure the foreign investors that their interests will be protected. But as we said this this afternoon, we also it's not an investment in all costs. We want to make sure that the investment that comes into Myanmar are, is socially responsible, that it protects the environment, it protects the interests of the ethnic people. So there are certain guarantees that we uh, would need to it, make sure that the foreign companies do understand that they are not here just to make quick money. We are in long-term relationship. We'll do our best to protect the interests, but at the same time, they also have to adhere to the local laws. And what specific obligations do you want international investors to abide by? Well, see, uh, here we are very fortunate. If you think about the OECD countries, these are the richest countries, uh, the 22 richest countries in the world. They have adopted many years ago, uh, based on the UN guiding principles, what they call responsible business conduct. The acronym is RBC. So all the OECD countries, if they are working abroad, would have to adhere to the RBC. And therefore, all we are asking is, please, uh, honor the obligations, commitment you've already made as a member of the OECD country so that uh, that you protect the environment, you protect human rights, uh, you obey the law. These are obligations which are internationally agreed upon. So we are hoping that uh, any British firm, because Britain being part of the OECD uh, country, would, uh, would honor the obligations that, that are already made. 
Is there any concern, though, if uh, businesses invest now, that some of those proceeds from that investment will go to the established power groups in the country and to the military or the businessmen who uh, have strong connections to the government? That, that has been the case in the past, and that was one of the rationale or reasons uh, why uh, the, especially the human rights activists you know, say that uh, you should not invest in Myanmar because all the investment proceeds uh, will go to Maoist to be. But as you know, we recently acceded to the EITI, which is the Attractive Industry Transparency Initiative, which then means that any proceeds from the uh, attractive industries will be uh, made known to everyone. It will be open, it will be transparent, uh, totally transparent. So I don't think any investors uh, should be concerned, or even a small investor in England should be concerned that the money that they invest in, the proceeds will go to, because I think there needs to be a much deeper understanding and appreciation of the changes that are happening in our country. You know, we know that's not perfect. We know that it's still work in progress. There's a lot of work to be done. But at least one, we can assure that, you know, uh, because most of the arguments that are made in terms of that these proceeds from investment will, will go to the powers to be are in the old era. Now we have we've turned the corner. We, we no longer have this situation where the proceeds, you know, there's no transparency, there's no openness, that you don't know where uh, the revenues that are generated go to. We now have clear, you know, uh, idea of where, how much is received how much uh, is uh, taken by the government. So there's a quite an apparent budgetary process uh, that is involved with any foreign drug investment in our country. And how important is, is a strong rule of law and an independent judiciary to the economy of Burma? Well, it, you know, we, we look at the lessons learned and the best practices from other countries, especially neighboring countries like Singapore. We know that the reason Singapore had developed was a strong culture of rule of law, adhering to the law. So we do recognize that uh, rule of law is critical uh, because, uh, because rule of law also is related to the level playing field, uh, which means that you know, uh, we are in more or less a capitalist economy where competition uh, is important, but competition should be fair. So there should not be any unfair advantage given to one party or one or one group or to one company. So the challenge for us to make sure that uh, the competition that is there is open and fair and then there's a level playing field. And some believe that it's very important to reform the constitution in order to get an independent judiciary and to break down some of the historical impunity that the military has enjoyed. How important do you think that is? Well, uh, so far, you see, in the discussion with the constitutional reforms, the, re uh, the reform of the judicial branch, because currently, as you know, because of our new uh, changes, we have three, ex three branches of government, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. We realize that the judicial arm of the government must be strengthened in terms of transparency, in terms of independence. That's still a work in progress. We know that a lot of work needs to be done. And of course, you know, even in the parliament, the head of the, uh, the committee looking into rule of law is no other than the Aung San Suu Kyi. So uh, you know, uh, it, it does demonstrate that the, the, the whole nation is not just the government. The whole nation is interested in rule of law. And to have someone like her you know, taking charge of this process and uh, whatever is needed in, in terms of uh, constitutional changes will be done. And what do you think of Aung San Suu Kyi? Do you think the government and, and, the, and she and the NLD can work effectively together? I think all along what we have said is we need uh, national reconciliation. And this is why the government has allowed uh, the party to enter into the by-elections in 2012. She's part of the uh, political landscape. Uh, I think they were, they are working t towards a common understanding, and I'm, I, I hope you know the future will be good for the country. 
Um, some have said that the reform process is stalling and there's a concern it might start to slip backwards. Uh, what do you say to that? Do you think the country is still going in the right direction? Well, there are two issues. In terms of change, uh, as any student of physics know, it's the direction and the speed. I think we are on the right direct direction. There's no question about this. The direct, uh, trajectory is there, the path is very clear. The only issue is speed. And of course, speed also depends on a lot of factors. Sometimes we can speed up, we can accelerate. Sometimes it's slowed down for certain reasons. So, but as long as we are in the right direction, I think the speed is not an issue. You know, we, will, we will proceed, we will, we will go where we want to go because we all of us have the same aspirations, same goals. And do you feel that culture of impunity that the, the military has had over the last five decades, is that something that is still problematic? And I'm thinking here of issues such as land grabbing, for example, that still seems to be a problem in some areas, or do you feel this is being tackled? It has been addressed, uh, you know, it has been addressed, but I think uh, the whole issue is it's never, I would say, black and white. It, it's some grey areas. We need to work through this. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's, it's our country, we have to live with this, we have to live with uh, the past. Uh, I think we, we, as Nelson Mandela says, you know, we will not, we, can, we cannot forget, but we can forgive. So the question is, how do we move forward? Because, you know, going back to the past, going back to what has happened, doesn't help very much. I think we need to look forward. Uh, you know, things have been done, that's done. It's, you know, there's nothing, you cannot bring it back. What we can do is how do we address these issues so that, you know, it, we, people, uh, especially the young, can look forward to a brighter future. That is our aspiration. Do you think there's still any sort of culture of fear among the population, uh, or do you think that's now being broken down? Well, there's, you know, we, most of us, majority of us are Buddhists, so the, the issue of mutual understanding, tolerance, I think pervades throughout the society. And even the sort of non-Buddhist Christians, uh, Muslims, Hindus, uh, you know, all, all, although they might uh, have different, uh, different beliefs, all believe in peaceful resolution, you know, reconciliation, tolerance, forgiveness. So that's what we're trying to do. And do you see economic growth and uh, democratic reform as going hand in hand? Well, you know, as a student of, or as a teacher of economics, it's, it's never economics, it's always political economy. You cannot distinguish politics and economics. So, as, you know, what the Burmese saying is very nice, the uh, Myanmar saying, uh, as the water rises, the water lily rises too. So we have to make sure that, you know, uh, the, as the economy rises, political, uh, space is increased, as particular space increase, the economy rights, because we need to look at both the rights, political rights as well as the, uh, the economic rights. That should go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And you feel that that, that is being That's the only direction, yes. Yeah. Um, how big a problem is, is corruption? You mentioned the EITI scheme, getting more transparency into the extractives industry, and I know that this has been a, a great success so far. There have been other initiatives yes. like that? Uh, we, we have, uh, you know, for the first time in so many years, we adopted, uh, accepted the results of the Transparency International. As you know, it is uh, produced every year annual report by an outfit, Transparency International, based in Bond, Germany. It ranks the countries. So in the past, we, we often do not even know that there's such a report. Now, since three, four years, we the government has accepted the report because, as you know, the gov the report itself is CPI, which is Corruption Perception Index, because corruption uh, is sometimes uh, an issue of perception, and therefore we recognize we are aware of the challenges we have, uh, and in addition to accepting uh, the report of Transparency International, the government is also uh, acceded to what is called the UN Convention Against Corruption, uh, UNCAC, which then means we are a member country. We are committed to trying to reduce or eliminate corruption. The other initiative is, as was mentioned this morning by myself, 
we're doing the UN Global Compact. Among the four pillars, the last one is anti-corruption. And therefore, you know, and then we have, for the first time in history, set up a UN a Myanmar anti-corruption commission. So, uh, so these are the efforts that the government is trying to do to ensure that corruption can be addressed. It cannot be eliminated completely. No country has done it, but it can be reduced. And just regarding, just going back a moment to the constitutional issue, and that specific point about the 25% of military um, having uh, seats in Parliament, is that something that you think needs to be addressed going, going forward? Well, the thing is, I think, uh, it's not for me to say, but the, the, uh, the, there is a process going on, uh, trying to look at uh, what are the uh, constitutional clauses that need to be changed, what cannot be changed. You know, every side has their own story, so we need to listen to all all sides and see what is the best interest of the country. But uh, I think Myanmar is not alone uh, in, in making such a stipulation. There are other countries that have done it in the region too. But uh, you know, as the country develops, as democracy uh, takes more root, I think all these can be resolved. And I was in Burma last year, and I was in Yangon and, and Naypyidaw, and. Uh, there was great feeling of the country was moving in the right direction, um, but people did say that you get a false sense of the speed of reform in Yangon and Naypyidaw compared to out in the rural areas. And I just wonder how you can ensure that everyone is feeling the impact of the economic and the political reforms and not just those at the very sort of centres. Of... Well, let me give you an example. You know, uh, four or five years ago, I exchange rate to a dollar. The official was six chats, and in the black market, it's 1,200. Nowadays, there's no black market. It's completely gone because of the liberalization and re reunification of the exchange rate. Now, that impact, you know, is it felt by the poor farmer direct? We cannot give that answer. But then if you look at the, the exporters, you know, who, who export, uh, produce, importers who produce farm equipment, etc. It makes a difference for them. They don't have to go uh, into the black market through the foreign exchange. So, uh, oftentimes people say, well, you know, the effect is not there, the impact is not there for the poor farmer. But maybe not directly, but indirectly there's a lot of effort that's been done. For example, the uh, central bank is now an independent authority. It can decide on its own. Does it make a difference to the ordinary farmer? Probably not directly. But it, the, the policies, the independent policies of the central bank, you know, looking at monetary policy, would obviously affect the poor farmers. So I think one needs to take a balance of, you know, is it a positive or negative impact? Is there a particular country you look to as inspiration as to where you'd like to see Myanmar in, say, 10 years' time? No because we think that we, we are on our own path, that we will go. But we, uh, the international community, the World Bank, ADP, uh, the recent McKinsey report, the 2030 projection is we will become a middle-income country by 2030. You know, we will join the ranks of middle-income countries. We will go on our own path, because our, our way is different from the way the Chinese developed or the Singaporeans developed. So we can pick and choose what is the best in, in both in our region and in beyond our region because there are countries in transition in Eastern Europe, in Poland, Hungary, uh, Czechoslovakia, we, we know the lessons. We also look at Latin America where they also went through the same transition. Uh, so I think we are fortunate that we can uh, look on the lessons learned and best practices from other countries. And your message to the international community is we're open for business, um, come and, and invest responsibly and bring your international standards and that can only be a good thing. Yes, the only thing is that uh, you know, we, we have high expectations of foreign direct investment. As I mentioned this morning, there are four expectations. They will bring money, that's important. But even more important than money, they will also bring technology, which means we can leapfrog technology would really help. The third is what we don't have, access to market, because we were closed because of the sanctions. 
so the foreign firms can bring access to market, which is very important. And finally, which I think is very important, the foreign firms can bring in the kind of responsible business culture, the management culture. So these four things are what we are pinning our hopes on for the direct investments. Thank you very much for your time. Thank really you so appreciate much. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.